We continue our series to be light. So if you turn with me in your Bibles, we're going to look at the book of Matthew this morning. Appreciate Brooke and Noah reading the passage of Scripture from Matthew that we're going to be looking at as well. Of course, you always want to start at the beginning, so turn with me to Matthew 1 if you would. Last week we discovered that Mark's gospel was written primarily to Gentiles, and therefore he only quoted two Old Testament passages in the entire book. Matthew, on the other hand, is written primarily to Jews, and he quotes the Old Testament more than 60 times. And so you can understand the difference. We're not going to go through all 60, by the way. We've covered a lot of that already. Matthew writes of Jesus' genealogy, and if there's anything that people have ever ever said to one another or to me, it's why did they put the begats in the Bible? If you've got King James, it's begats, okay? Meaning father of. Um, the genealogy is very important, which we'll look at in a minute. Matthew writes of Jesus' genealogy, he writes of his baptism, he writes of his message, and he writes of the miracles to convince the reader of the same inescapable conclusion, conclusion and spotlighting Jesus Christ as the king of of the Jews. Remember, he's writing to Jews. And so he he uses the genealogy as a starting point to say, this is his lineage, therefore you need to know that he is of the Jews and he is the king of Jews. So first is the king's lineage in Matthew 1, 1 through 17. And you may be asking yourself, he's not really going to read that, is he? And I am. (laughs) I'm reading the New American Standards. You won't probably hear the word begat. But here's what it says. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. Okay, so Matthew starts right there. It is the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. By the way, that is contested in the Islamic world. And not, not that Abraham was the son of Isaac, but that they, the Islams believe that when Abraham went to sacrifice his son, the son he took with him was Ishmael. And that, of course, changes everything. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez was the father of Hizron, and Hizron the father of Ram, and Ram was the father of Amminadad, and Amminadad the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed and by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, Abijah the father of Asa. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, Joram the father of Uzziah, Uzziah was the father of Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz, Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. Some of these names you're recalling, aren't you, from our previous study, if you've been with us during this Be Light series. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah. Josiah became the father of Jeconiah and the brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah became the father of Shatil, and Shatil, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abidahu, Abidahu, the father of Elikim, Elikim, the father of Azor, and Azor was the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Akim. Achim, the father of Elihu. Elihu was the father of Eliezer. Eliezer, the father of Mathan. Mathan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob was the father of Joseph and the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Writing to the Jewish people, this lineage was huge. Mark didn't have to include it because Mark was writing to Gentiles. They could care less about Jesus' lineage. But to the Jews, Matthew was trying to prove a point that Jesus came from the Jewish lineage of Abraham and David. 
So all the generations, verse 17, from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. We'll stop there for a moment. This is Abraham's heir, Jesus. Very important that this genealogy is included in the Scriptures. We, who are not born Jewish, most of us are not born Jewish, we have a couple maybe in here. We also as Gentiles, and I hear this and I started with this, why do they have that in there? It's crucial to understand the connection from Abraham to the birth of Christ. He is the promised Messiah. And he is humanity's Savior. Because in that lineage... There are mentioned four women, three of whom are Gentiles. And let me remind you again of that of significance. And ladies, if you think that you're misunderstood in this culture, in that culture, in that time period, ladies were nothing more than property. They could not, they, their testimony would not be heard in court because they did not have the significance of, hum, of mankind, of, of men. And so women were not even allowed to testify in court if they saw a crime, because it was not believable, because they were female. Gentiles were considered the most vulgar species in, by the Jews. And Tamar... Rahab and Ruth were all Gentile women included in the lineage of Jesus, the Messiah. You see, the significance of all this, look to Galatians 3, 28 and 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promises. A significance here, right? That means all who are sitting in this room today who have prayed to receive Christ, we are of Abraham's descendants, heirs to the promise of God, to his throne. You see that, I know that most of us are not Bible scholars and we're not going to tear that apart, but just having that there signifies to us that Jesus came not to just to be saviors of the Jews. He didn't come to be an earthly king of the Jews. He came to be the king of kings and lord of lords of all humanity. He came to save people from their sins. And he came, and that's the next part that we heard read earlier today, so I'm not going to read it again, but he came through the virgin birth. If there's, ever, if there's ever a need to have faith in God, it's to believe that a woman was conceived by God, the Holy Spirit, and she never had any sexual relations with a man, and yet she was pregnant. I can't imagine Joseph trying to understand that. Matter of fact, he didn't understand it, and that's what was read until an angel came to him in a vision and said, listen, this is of God. And you need to quit worrying about what you're going to do with your wife. You need to take her as your wife and you need to go and start doing what God's called you to do. Now he woke up and I don't understand that kind of vision, that kind of dream. I've ever had one that pronounced. But when he woke up, he didn't wake up from a slumber and go, wow, was that ever a weird dream? It was an encounter with God's servant. And then when he woke up, it says that he then took Joseph, or took Mary, to be his wife and did not have any relationships with her until Jesus was born. The lineage of Jesus is unique. It is the king's lineage. And it has to be believed by faith. And then there's the king's service, also found in the book of Matthew, 
chapter 4. We're not going to go through all of this. But Jesus, remember, went and was tempted by evil, by Satan himself. Matter of fact, at the beginning of chapter 4, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. How would you like to have that escort? Holy Spirit going, now I'm going to escort you up here, and now the devil's going to bombard you and try to tempt you to do evil. But at the end of that encounter, in chapter 10, or verse 10 of that chapter, it says, Then Jesus said to Satan, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall not worship the Lord your God, or you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He went through those temptations, came out without yielding or surrendering, but rather counteracted what the devil was trying to do, and then told him at the end, Go. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him over the only. And the devil left him. Behold, the angels came and began to minister to Jesus. The king's service began with unyielding to temptation and sin. He had not yet embarked upon his ministry. Here he is unyielding to temptation and sin. Then he is unmatched in his teaching and healing. In the same chapter, you get on to verse 23. It says, Jesus was going throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him spread throughout Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering from various diseases and pains, diamonics and epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And when they saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and he, after he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and began to teach them and saying, and he goes into what we call the Beatitudes. Do you see the purposes for his divine power? Not just his mercy being demonstrated to those who were afflicted, but also the people, the gather. I mean, like he was like a movie star, like a rock star. People came from all over the place, not only to see him, but to experience and to encounter his healing power. And then he got them all on this, this big mount, amphitheater kind of thing. And then he begins to teach them truth. He is unmatched in his teaching, in his healing. Matter of fact, as you go through the scriptures, you hear people say, isn't this the Nazarene? Isn't this the carpenter's son? They're amazed. Because he is unmatched in his teaching, in his healing as a servant, as he serves the people. And he's unswerving in his message. And we're going to jump a lot, I mean really far in this Matthew now to chapter 19. Much happens in between then and now. But here he's unswerving in his message in chapter 19, verses 16. Someone came, this is the story of the rich young ruler, someone came to him and said, Teacher, what should I do that I may obtain eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Remember the story of the rich young ruler? His response was, which one? Jesus said, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear a false witness. Honor your father and mother and you love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these things I've kept since my youth. What am I lacking? Jesus went then to the heart. And said, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven, and come follow me. And when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. God wasn't asking for his money. He was asking for his life to be surrendered to him. Because he knew that his love was for his possessions. 
And Jesus said to his disciples after this, Truly I say to you, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to him, With people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. He was unswerving in that message. It's the same message yesterday, today, and forever. And then there's the king's sacrifice. The part that made it all possible, the reason he came in the manger was for the results at the cross. He was betrayed, first of all, in his sacrifice. In chapter 27, verses 3 and 9 and 10, we read of his betrayal. That Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned. He felt remorse, returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. 9 and 10, it says, Then then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. The Old Testament now being fulfilled in the New, that Jesus would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, and that silver eventually would be used to buy a potter's field. And then Jesus, not only was he betrayed, but then when he was arrested, he was beaten. In verse 27 of chapter 27, the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, a reed in his right hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him, and they took the reed and beat him on the head with it. And after they mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off of him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. The king sacrifice was of his own body. And then they belittled him. It says in verse 33, And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall, and after tasting it he was unwilling to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots and sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put up a charge against him, which reads, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at them, wagging their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests... Also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel, let him come now down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let him rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. You can't beat a person much more than when he's down and dying and you're still insulting him. Here's two sin, sinful prisoners hanging on the cross, going to die the same death, and they're insulting Jesus. We find out later on the one sees how Christ responds and he asks Christ to remember him in paradise. But initially, they're both casting insults. The very people he came to save are throwing insults and belittling him the people who should know better, the, the religious leaders of the day who had responsibility to unfold the scriptures for the people are insulting and belittling the Savior. And then Jesus dies. Chapter 28, 5 and 6. He is resurrected and verse 5 and 6 says that the angel said to the women who came to the tomb, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, 
for he has risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. The king's sacrifice was not just to die for people, but to live so that we might live in him and through him. And all of this began with the begats. And I want you to kind of follow the, the thought here is that it ends with the begats. Because in chapter 28, Jesus really says, go and continue making folks a part of my family. Chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus comes up. Or let's, let's go back a little bit because I found this rather fascinating again when I read it. Verse 16, the eleven disciples, because Judas has died, proceeded to Galilee to the mountain where, with which Jesus had designated. Now they're walking with the resurrected Christ, okay? They're now seeing Jesus. They have touched Jesus. They have had encounters with Jesus. They know this is the risen Christ. Verse 17, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. Still, this isn't in the upper room now when Jesus makes an appearance. That's already happened. They are now at the mountain when Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. And it says, here's the 11 disciples, and they're seeing this, and they're going, I'm not sure this is real. I can understand their doubt and their bewilderment, and Jesus comes up and he speaks to them because they are afraid. Because they know that he's planning to be ascended into heaven. And they're going to be left here to carry on his work and he won't be there, they think. Because they've experienced him only bodily. And Jesus says to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. In other words, I control all that's going on here. I have authority over everything that happens in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and I am with you. I'm, bodily I won't be there, but I'm still with you wherever you go. My authority and my power and my presence has been planted in you who are followers and disciples of Christ. Therefore, make more children of the kingdom by telling them the story of the Savior. Keep the lineage of Christ going. Now, I don't know all of my lineage, but I can tell you I know this much because I never, I never met my grandparents except for my grandmother on my father's side. They were long gone before I was born. But I know that Grandfather John, whose Bible I still possess, great-grandfather John, actually, whose Bible I still possess, loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gave birth to my grandfather who gave birth to my father who gave birth to me. But it wasn't just a physical birth. Each one of those men passed Jesus along to their family members. Yeah. Praise God. I know my grandmother who I did know was a godly Christian woman. My dad didn't come to faith in Christ until he was an adult and married and had children. But my lineage goes back not only to Grandfather John, but it goes back to great, 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 eventually to Jesus, right? Because those who come to faith in Christ are a part, we read, of the Abrahamic covenant. Covenant we become a part of the family of God. This morning in Sunday school, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. This morning in Sunday school, questions was raised about those 
who've never heard the gospel? What is their eternal destiny? And of course, we're trying to understand and get handle on the fact that if a person doesn't have that sin issue removed and redeemed through Christ, then it remains there and separates them for all eternity from God. Well, how are they supposed to hear? How is some, some person off in some remote village or some village that believes in a different religion that doesn't include Christ, how are they supposed to come to saving knowledge of Christ? You know the answer, don't you? All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. It's up to us. God uses his children to promote his message to bring more people into the kingdom of God. We can't change people's minds, but we are supposed to reveal God's truth so that the Spirit can work on them. Matthew ends his book as he started, spotlighting the lineage of Jesus Christ as the king of the Jews, but a savior for all. As we approach Christmas, we focus on the birth of Christ, which is natural and good. But it, again, I need to remind all of us, it isn't just to bring us good feelings of the holidays and get family together. It isn't so that we can go, wasn't that a sweet story? Or didn't the kids, aren't, weren't they cute? And all this kind of, this kind of stuff that we all enjoy is to remind us that we live in a world and it, and it can be no more accented how evil our world is than what this country experienced at that shooting. That is evil running rampant. And it gets worse unless Christ comes and redeems people and nations. And he can. And he says, I have these points of lights all over the place. They're called my children. Those who accepted Christ are to be a light of God's truth to others so that evil is defeated and people are saved and redeemed from their sins. The message is Jesus is still the Savior of the world and uses us as his messengers of truth. We were once children of darkness, but now we are children of light. We need to live as children of light. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this incredible story of your birth, life, death, resurrection. It has so much more greater significance than just the, 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 the romantic kind of feeling of a holiday. God, you are calling us to live as children of light, to share this glorious message of salvation with those that are living in darkness. Lord, help us. Encourage us. Move us to get out of our comfort zone and share God's truth. And let the Spirit do the work but that we would surrender as your messenger. Let us be a, a Christmas present to others by giving them the greatest gift of all, and that is the message of salvation and redemption. Thank you, Father, that you have saved us from our sins. Let us spread that true message of hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.